really was wanting to put something in the world that the grown-up gets as much out of it as the kids do. More, arguably. I really believe that something special happened with this story. We could not believe how many people jumped on board to help us bring this thing to the screen. It is the most amazing thing to be in a position now where we can bring this to the screen. It's whimsical and it's fun, but it's also got a lot of heart. My goal is to make you cry uh, as much as you laugh. You can't just run off. They've got a pop rocket. Really? When you ran off, I had to leave Lily alone. Lily? Lily? He's a plucky of feathers. Hi, Clark. Get up. The black carriage is here. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Chris Wall, executive producer of Wing for the Saga Animated Series. And, of course, we have Andrew Peterson. He is actually traveling to a show in Memphis. Is that right? Yeah, we're going to Memphis. I'm on a tour bus. Here, let me show you. The, uh, <laughs> you can see there's proof. There's Tennessee going by in the background. Uh, so, yeah, my connection may be a little spotty, but I'm going to do my best. That was fantastic. Man on the move. I love it. Well, we are excited to be with you guys this afternoon. Uh, a number of you have asked for a while now about music. And as you know, music is a really important part of our story. And so today is all about music. Um, uh, quick updates on where we are. So we are in production on season one of our animated series uh, to release right at the end of this year. Uh, we're so excited. That release schedule, we hope to have teasing out for you next week. So uh, we'll have another live stream and, and get that out for you. Uh, but we can't wait to bring it to you. Um, we have just, Andrew and I, we just saw episode six in its revised animatic. And, and it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, it, it <laughs> I think, Andrew, it, the feeling after you watch the season finale is you got to keep this going. Oh, man, absolutely. Yeah, I feel like the book one is just scratching the surface of how big the world is. And so, yeah, it, it sets the table just right for that. Yeah. So if you guys have uh, read uh, Lord of the Rings, <clears throat> uh, book one is kind of like being in the Shire, right? And, and you're just kind of being invited into a journey and stepping out and maybe experiencing a couple small things. But book two is like encountering the ring wraiths and, and, and really getting into some you know, big action sequences. So uh, uh, we're so excited because we've already begun thinking about that. Um, but season one uh, animation on episode three is underway uh, and uh, lots of beautiful, beautiful imagery. Andrew, uh, you and I have gotten to see uh, some of that imagery <laughs> of the last couple of days. Uh, tell me about what your thoughts are yeah. seeing some of the fun. Oh man! Well, actually, just just about two, two hours ago, I was able to review a few of the uh, more finished bits of animation, and I just I'm geeking out. I'm here with the band, and I keep going, "Hey guys, look at this! Hey guys, look at this!" And uh, it's just it's just cooler than I ever thought that it would look. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. Yeah, and um, we are so excited because in about a week we get to show them our first real trailer. Uh, and so a lot of the stuff that we've been looking at, audience at home, is stuff that will go into our first teaser trailer. So we did the little first look back in March that was kind of just an early peek at it. And this one's going to be our first teaser that has some, uh, some pretty cool stuff in it. And uh, Andrew, I don't know if you saw, we tested this. Yeah. We had uh, the agency actually take it out and test it with some kids and see what they thought. And uh, it, was, it was very positive. They were super excited. Um, and so this feels like, and they so kind of reference some other shows like How to Train Your Dragon, and uh, and it, that's right in line. 
you know, that's like, yeah, that's the kind of show we want to be. Yeah, I mean, so it's great. It's um, so great. It's, I keep thinking like, as far as people seeing the short film, you know, like the short film was beautiful for what it was, but I just think people have no idea how we were able to take some of that technology and some of those ideas and just turn it up to 11 in the best way. It just looks fantastic. So if I was 12 year old, Andrew was losing his mind. Right now. That's right. Yeah. Um, so a lot of fun stuff happening. Um, if you didn't see it last week um, or week before, we have our first merchandise. So we have some really cool shirts. Uh, this is one of those. This is definitely the most popular one. Uh, we've got uh, Lily on the cliff with a sea dragon. Sorry, it's a touch wrinkly. That's just unkind. Um, and then uh, I actually, I was uh, recently visiting with my family in Colorado and my dad was wearing his uh, tree uh, wing feather shirt, which is really cool. It's all like really great fabric. I'm so proud of our team for the stuff they did. And of course, my favorite, uh, the toothy cow beware the toothy cows uh that guy is if you missed our animation uh live stream last week uh, we actually showed you a bit of our toothy cow in action uh not final renders but you know you get to see what a toothy cow looks like and i think it's one of the coolest things uh anyways those are out there those shirts uh our show is always going to be uh free for the audience but uh ways you can support us is you can go pick up some t-shirts and that helps make this show keep going uh, so visit wingfeathersaga.com slash store if you're so inclined. We'd love that support, uh, and we're so excited to bring it to you. Um, we also have another video, Andrew, I forgot to tell you, um, that I can't wait to show. It's it's very close. We're still working on it, but that shows the scope of the team that we've been working with over this last year. We employ over 70 different artists in different roles across our, our little company, and, and they're all, they're, a lot of them here in Nashville, which is awesome, but they're scattered throughout the United States and even the world. And we had an all company meeting this morning with some of those folks and it's just so delightful to see these people who are super passionate about this really cool story that Andrew wrote uh, and that we're getting to bring to the screen. Uh, in case you don't know how that all worked, last year about this time, we actually did a round of investments where people like you could go buy shares in our company. Not the series like season one or an episode, but like buy in the whole company and be a part of all that we're going to go make. And so we really want to get going on season two. And so right now there's a little pledge thing. You see, oh, oh, point that way, Chris, uh, that, that we've had people pledging uh, so far over $3.4 million uh, to help us with season two. Um, if that offering comes available, the way this works is if we decide to go live with that and, and sell more shares, uh, you'll get an email and say, hey, do you want to jump in here? So, so if you go out there and pledge, um, you get a place in line. It's kind of like a little holding a ticket. Um, and if you want to partner with us in that way, uh, that's available. You can go look at that information. Um, just go to angel.com slash wing feather and you can learn about that. We had uh, almost 8,000 people that helped us make season one. Uh, and those people are still long. They get to be a part of our whole long journey. Uh, wow. Somebody just jumped in for a thousand. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, so uh, that's all coming. Uh, and season two, uh, uh, the scripts are ready. Uh, I think episode set seven is out for drafting, but we've got uh, those episodes coming along. Uh, we've seen, Andrew, I think you saw some of the thumbnails that we worked up of some of the uh, really cool moments from episode one of season two uh, in storyboards. And um, trust us, there's some cool moments coming up, folks. Uh, you don't want to miss it. Um, yeah. All right. Let's move into the music. Enough. And... Um, Andrew, uh, when you were working on the books, I know that w as we read the books as a yes. family, we were aware of how oh, important oh, do you, music. Do you mean? Do you mean the flight to? Yeah, you're going. Keep talking. You're good. I got you. He's in and out. Okay, well, I'm going to keep talking for a minute. Andrew, as soon as you're back up, just keep just talk again, and I'll let you in. Well, if you guys have read the books, you know that music plays a really pivotal role in the storytelling, uh, that music is used even as like a magical element to really uh, change things. And, and we talk a lot, our own company, uh, one of our core values is to create stories that create in someone a sense of deep longing. Um, and uh, it, music is one way to get there. Stories do that. Music is another way to get there. Andrew has written a lot of wonderful music that does exactly that. Andrew, tell us about what you see the role of music in the story. Yeah, well, as a songwriter, um, I am, can you hear me now? Can you guys get me? Yeah. Uh, I 
I have always been fascinated, as long as I can remember, with music because as a kid, part of what got me into writing songs was the fact that I sensed that there was some power to it uh, that I could feel in myself. Like I would, I would hear a song, watch a movie, and listen to the soundtrack later, and feel my heart kind of kicking around in a way that nothing else really made it do. And I was very interested in that. Um, as a Christian, I was always fascinated by like, okay, why did God make the world this way? How, how can I participate in that? You know? Uh, so I, it wasn't ever enough for me to just listen to a song. I always wanted to like pop the hood of the song and look at the engine and see why it was working the way that it was working. You know, same thing with stories. I would read a book and I'd be like, wait, why, why is my heart feeling this way? And so in this world, I really wanted to hint at that, that what, like, what if, what if that idea was taken to uh, like uh, the next level so mm -hmm. that uh, the songs were, um, could be not like there was serious power that was kind of inhabiting the songs and you could, uh, the songs became a weapon. They became a, a way to fight back in the darkness, you know, in a very literal way. Like I think of that uh, literally, but it kind of happens in a mysterious way that you can't really control. You know, as a songwriter, I play the songs and sometimes they don't, they don't work. Sometimes I'm like, well, that was not a great show. Other times I play the exact same songs uh, in the exact same order, same verses and words and solos, whatever, and something happens. And uh, so all you can do as the musician is make yourself available to the possibility that something wonderful is going to happen, that, that God will choose to, to use the music in a certain way. So that's kind of how I think of it. So in this world... Uh, I wanted music to have a certain power. And so people that have watched this short film saw a, te a taste of that with the sea dragons, right? And this little girl singing this, this song, Jürgen's tune, um, and then it awakened something in creation. You know, we had like the fireflies buzzing about, that kind of thing. Um, I was just out west, Andrew, I don't know if I told you this, and I just got, I really needed to hear some Rich Mullins. Uh, and listen to World is Best I Remember, it, Volume One and Two, and Liturgy Legacy, and was crying, and, and I don't know why. <laughs> like, there's something that, that <laughs> describing experiences, particularly his his ability to describe the West, uh, man alive, uh, it, it does that. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I loved the fact that in the, you know, moving from a book to a visual art form, like we're doing, when we were making the short film. Oh, he's cutting. Come back. Come back. Okay. Well, as, as soon as he comes back into service with the rest of that story, one of the songs in the short film that you guys may have heard, it's in the credits, uh, is uh, My Love Has Gone Across the Sea. It's this beautiful song that Andrew actually uh, has, has recorded uh, uh, a couple times and, and with his daughter, Sky, uh, she recorded with us. Uh, during that short film, and that will make an appearance in season one. Uh, it's actually the theme that when you turn into these live streams, there's a little bit of music playing, uh, that theme is still playing. And it's a song that we call um, a happy, sad song, right? Where it's a mixture of this happiness and sadness. And you're going to hear that a lot today as we talk through our music stuff, that we want to create uh, a rich experience. So we're not just doing the happy side of things without a sense of the sadness, nor are we saying in the sadness without a sense of hope. Uh, that we want our music to really help us emotionally uh, to feel uh, both of those things. And um, so we have been working hard uh, getting some of this music uh, put together, getting a team put together. And to set that up, we have a little video that kind of introduces some of our early calls as we were beginning to think about what the Wing Feather Saga season one would sound like. So let's watch this video. My hope is that the soundtrack will do a great job of supporting what we're doing at the same time i want it to be so awesome that like it's part of the story yeah but i like absolutely i think that's exactly what i was thinking that there's something if we set ourselves if we set limitations like that to ourselves like okay we're going to try to lean on small ensembles all of a sudden we've got something that yeah. hasn't really been done very often hasn't been utilized part of the reason i'm drawn to the to the, what the Arcadian Wild is bringing to it is because there's a very organic, like I want to hear the pluck of the, of the pick on the mandolin string, you know what I mean? Like I want it to feel organic and like it's grounded in a real world versus some pad heavy thing. Well, and it gives you the, 
if you've heard a, a score that's just 80p symphony for an hour that's one thing but if you're hearing this it gives you so much more latitude to say oh just adding two instruments yeah. you've right you've yeah. perked that much energy up and, and now imagine how much further you can go if you need to um and i would also say i was thinking about this earlier uh is that there needs to be some like sadness i don't know okay so for example kurt when you orchestrated the my love has gone across the sea that song and that melody which i still think would be a wonderful main theme of the thing um can sound like a folk song and as soon as you throw the strings on it it sounds super epic and if you had one lonely voice singing it it would sound really sad um, I was reminded again, the approach on this series is going to be series television where, uh, Kurt, like we did on Slugs and Bugs, we're going to go in studio and record a set of cues, right? And then we'll have custom kind of cue to cue score moments where it's like really capturing a specific bit of action. I'm so excited talking about this right now. Like, <laughs> like the, uh, the idea that the soundtrack could be a, like a, its own character in the in the story is so exciting to me. And on the Scandinavian side of it, I, I had uh, I just want to affirm you that I love the way that we're thinking is really exciting. And the fact that the soundtrack could stand alone as its own work of art is something to shoot for. Okay, so we spent a lot of time on Zoom chatting with all these folks, so uh, apologies for that being the thing that you get to look at. But uh, we are so excited about our music team. Let me introduce them and welcome them in. So we have with us a handful of folks. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. So I'll start uh, in the middle underneath. This is uh, Kurt Heineke. Uh, Kurt is a longtime composer and orchestrator over on Veggie Tales. We were together and then was with us on the Wing Feather Saga short film. Uh, to the other side is Isaac Horn, one half of Arcadian Wild. If you don't know that band, uh, we'll excuse you to go right now on Spotify or Apple Music and go pull up Arcadian Wild and go listen to their music. It's fantastic. Uh, Isaac is uh, a composer as well and worked with us on the short film. Glad to have you guys back. And then new in the room, Ben Shive. You're down below me, so down here. Hi, Ben. Uh, ben hey. is a veteran Nashville producer and musician and uh, producing great bands like Colony House and Andrew Peterson. Uh, and uh, we're so glad to have him uh, joining us uh, for Wing Feather Saga Season 1 as our producer. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good to see you. Andrew, in case you missed it, is on a tour bus right now to Memphis, so he will join us in a step away. He's not uh, being unkind to you. Doesn't you know? Just <laughs> he, that's what he's doing. I think you know the you know the drill. I think you guys have traveled a little bit. Uh, okay, so it's so good to see you guys. Let's talk a bit about music. Um, I want to first talk about roles. So I'll describe it, and then you guys can add some color commentary. Um, obviously, Andrew, as a musician and, and songwriter himself, has a lot of great ideas about the way he wants to, to see that music come to life. And, um, and, and uh, so in that, we reached out to Ben to join us as a producer because he knows a lot of kind of Andrew. He kind of can be proxy to step in and say, hey, guys, here's how we want to make this soundscape and, and things that I know work within, you know, stuff that Andrew's created in the past and, and what we want to do here. Uh, below me, of course, Kurt uh, is just such a longtime composer of cinema uh, of, uh, Kurt, we talk about this a lot, but um, music for picture, right? Where it's it's music that's in service of picture of a story, uh, which is different than in a standalone song that kind of serves it differently. And so Kurt has that amazing experience. You know, he's got a few instruments around behind him there too. Um, and, uh, yeah, here's one of our first meetings. Uh, there's Lincoln, the other half of our kid in wild. Uh, this was one of our only times we got to be in person, uh, launching our music time together. Uh, and then Isaac, uh, is just a wonderful composer, writes a lot of great music and has, uh, uh, just a, a real love for, uh, finding interesting things, uh, to bring into other mediums. Uh, and so we heard that during the short film and we're so excited to be doing that together in season one. Uh, and then of course, Hey, uh, wow. We just, guys, just now in the bottom corner of this is very distracting, but we're going to get these pop-ups of people that are stepping in to pledge to invest with us to keep making this series, which that's amazing. Someone just jumped in for a thousand dollars. Thanks guys. That's awesome. Uh, okay. So, uh, the way this works is, uh, you know, Kurt 
and Isaac and Ben, all three will do some writing together and Ben's kind of writing heard on this. Uh, and we started this process to find some themes. Um, we knew we had our main theme, right? My love's gone across the sea as an anchor. Uh, but Isaac, uh, talk to me about, you know, cracking some of those early themes and some of the inspiration. We referenced it in the little video we, we played, but where you were finding some music that you felt like, uh, would kind of live in a distinct space uh, for our series. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I've I've kind of seen our uh, our role as just the one to bring um, that sort of like acoustic Nashville flair and color. Um, and uh, so I I I started to uh, do some brainstorming about some Nashville bands that I really really love. And I landed on uh, several. Um, one of them is a band called Hocktail. They're an instrumental band, and they are heavily influenced by Scandinavian music. And so then I immediately started listening to more Scandinavian music, and found this uh, th that th there's just this rich, rich, rich tradition there uh, that employs a lot of really interesting modes and scales and rhythms, and sort of what. Uh, Andrew said uh, about like, trying to reach this sort of happy, sad uh, blend. I found a lot of that there in in that sort of Scandinavian music. And I think where where we landed, it it, it doesn't necessarily sound like Scandinavian music, you know. But but with that as sort of the bedrock as a starting place, um, I feel like where where we ended up once all of all of the team put their fingerprints on it was something something unique. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm and so really Isaac, you ended up spending some time kind of sketching out the musical ideas, melodies, and this sort of thing. And then uh, Ben, I know that pops over to you pretty quickly to kind of listen to and, and offer. What sort of things are you listening for? What are you trying to uh, kind of aim for when you hear those? Yeah, I think that Isaac and I were both on a learning curve of having worked on songs. Um, where you're trying to serve a lyric and where you're trying to tell uh, an emotional story with usually a longer arc and also with an arc that's reliant on the lyric. And now we're trying to figure out a way to make music that leaves room for a picture and leaves room for dialogue and story. And so I think what we were trying to figure out is how to write music with less information. Um, I mean, not having less information as we wrote the music, but writing music that conveys less information. So we really leaned on Kurt for that because he has more experience with it. So I guess in the early stages, when Isaac was sending me ideas, I was listening for ideas that said too much. And um, so we, we talked about that uh, and there came a point where I didn't need to say anything about it anymore because he got the hang of it very, very quickly. So yeah. That's great. Yeah, and there's and there's a wonderful kind of uh, someone just mentioned orchestral epic stuff. So uh, with, there's this wonderful marriage that we're finding, right? Which is where you guys are able to find these 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 instrument choices, uh, whether that's mandolin or, or you know uh, a guitar, whatever that is. Electric guitar did not work. We tried it. Andrew was totally out on it. Uh, <laughs> we all cheered for it. Uh, but finding that and then saying, all right, Kurt, how do we give it the sense of of epic stakes? when we want it, right? We want to build to these big emotional moments. And then you're able to come in and supplement. Tell us about some of your process then of kind of building these out. Yeah, well, first of all, it's it's been an awesome experience working with with Ben and Isaac, Arcadian Wild, because um, the, the neat thing with this, and I know I'm not answering your question yet, Chris, is, uh, you know, not, none of us usually get to work in collaboration like this. And so to be able to with Andrew and Chris's help to find what, what is this soundscape we're going for? Isaac has mentioned it, you know, some Scandinavian, but mixed in there, it's, it's early European, but it's not Lord of the Rings, uh, early European Appalachian Nashville. You think all these, uh, intimate stringed instruments, uh, maybe they're not the traditional ones. Maybe it is guitar, but maybe it's something that you've never heard before. But when we have this vision of happy, sad music, Scandinavian instruments, this sort of stark openness, a lot of plucked, a lot of stringed instruments, 
then for each of us to take our interpretation of that was very refreshing because yeah isaac is writing stuff i could never write ben actually i mean it, his title says producer but he's written stuff for this too and it was just yeah. amazing to hear what they were coming up with once they they got the sense mm -hmm. of the flow of writing the picture now just give us a simple melody it doesn't have to resolve into a nice mm -hmm. chorus or whatever once they got the hang of that it was just incredible to hear the stuff they're coming up with so it was easy for me to take those and say okay now let's just embellish it a little bit it doesn't need an adp string orchestra in my sample library i found some of the most intimate small string sections I, I purchased this one library of just these very icy light string sounds yeah. that just give it this air to it got another uh, sample library of ironically or maybe not ironically scandinavian stringed instruments um these different plucked instruments that we're not familiar with but they they sound sort of familiar because they're acoustic but they're just left field enough that they're not just the stock guitar and mandolin. So so to be able to take those instruments and then maybe just enhance it a little bit. It could be a little bit of percussion, a little bit of some bells on top, some very light uh, string sustains underneath all their plucked things, just to give mm -hmm. it a little broader sound, a little more cinematic, expansive sound, but it still has this intimacy to it that defines who we are. And I think that, you know, uh, Ben, you've dealt with this a lot, but, you know, being in Nashville, there's a Nashville kind of sound, right, which which lives mm -hmm. somewhere in some sort of authentic authenticity. Uh, one of the things that Kurt has has done in his career beautifully is taking that sample library stuff, but mixing it with live instrumentation in a way that feels like it works. <laughs> you don't feel it sitting on top, uh, but also feels like uh, expansive, bigger than you think you're going to get. And then, of course, the um, um, distinct instruments. Uh, ben, what would you say in, in your experience, and I've, this has been the, probably the most common comment I've given to you, is I need it to feel more Nashville. <laughs> and often, I don't know what that mm -hmm. means, but I need you to find it for me. Uh, what is that for yeah. you when someone's looking for that in songs and music, the Nashville thing? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you already sort of said it. It's uh, I, Isaac was our ace in the hole for that because it really just meant things that are very physical, um, very close and intimate sounding and so if i wrote a cue that was strings and piano i would be looking for the piano especially to have lots of hammers lots of uh, pedal noise just things that make it sound like you're close and in the room um, and then i guess that's not specifically nashville so what we would tend to do is with almost any cue that i wrote or that kurt wrote there was a plan for how to incorporate what Isaac does. So we would hand it back to him and uh, he would, you know, I, I was, so I was, when I was writing cues, I was usually playing some acoustic guitar sample poorly on my keyboard to make sure that I was saving space for what Isaac would do. And then we'd hand the mm -hmm. cue back to Isaac and he'd play it. And voila, Nashville. That's great. And Isaac, we talked a lot about your contributions in that. And, we actually have a really great video of, you know, what we would say is your magnum opus here. So, uh, Ryan, can we play that for everybody? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome, Isaac. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's talk about, so we were talking about themes. And in this case, we were asking Isaac, hey, we want to get like a, something for the fangs. The fangs are the bad guys. We need it to be really bad. And there's this one scene in particular you're writing for where there's a, a, a player who's got to like play something terrible for the, and, and the, the animation team actually needed it. They like, hey, show us how you play that so we can animate this guy doing it and you sent that that really funny video um it's <laughs> some of the worst um but uh tell us about the yeah. adventure you've been on because we have asked you for things that are very out of the norm uh to your normal songwriting yeah well um yeah that that is that's a great example of of one of those moments where uh the the fangs sort of walk into the room and and uh yeah, the, I, I think the fangs, I think it's supposed to be a fang request, right? Specifically. Yeah. And uh, I think, I think 
that might have actually been Ben's idea to take because I think what I I did at first was just take whatever that that uh, guitarist was doing and just play it badly, uh, and then I think Ben was the one that said, "Why don't you just take a pick and just scrape it on the strings and just make it yeah. really like this?" You know, you don't even use this instrument this way. Um, and so I think there's been a lot of back and forth there. One of my, I think really one of my f favorite parts about this and one of the most challenging parts was nailing the fangs, like trying to, trying to find mm -hmm. a sound for them. And, I, and that's where we went. Uh, at first, my mind went to electric guitar. Well, let's just, let's just take this, you know, this, this instrument uh, that is really familiar, the acoustic guitar, sounds really nice and pretty, and let's make it distorted like the fangs. And yeah. uh, let's plug it through an amp and just turn the overdrive up and just sort of rock out for a little bit. And I had a lot of fun doing that, but I think it did, it went a little bit too far into like the 70s, 80s, you know, hair band kind of thing. Totally. Uh, and then whenever we said, you know, okay, that's sort of in the right direction. We're starting to get more distorted, which is what we want. How can we keep that in the context of these acoustic uh, physical instruments. And uh, I forget whose idea it was, probably Ben, uh, said, well, why don't we just take this, why don't you take like a slide uh, and just kind of do something similar with the pick where you're just like scraping the pick on the string, but you're using the slide and it, this metal slide on steel strings, it's really easy to make it, to make it buzzy. And whenever you're sliding from note to note, you know, it's easy to kind of overshoot the note a little bit or not quite get there. And so it created this really sort of haunting, uh, but also very like off, like it sounded sort of off kilter, um, but at the same time grounded it in, in the soundscape and in the world that, that we're trying, that we're, you know, trying, trying to hit. Um, yeah, that was really, really exciting, really fun. That's awesome. Uh, over the years, there has been an instrument uh, described in the books, and then people have actually, if you go to our, there, there's a Wing Feather Saga, which if you guys haven't looked at this recently, there's a Wing Feather Saga fan group uh, on Facebook, um, and they find the coolest stuff. Uh, I'm just astonished at, at the community here. But one of them had actually created a whistle harp. So this is something, an instrument that described in the wow. books, and, and we all had to say, okay, we have to make a whistle harp come to life. Kurt, that task ultimately fell to you. Uh, tell us about what elements you brought together to make a whistle harp uh, be heard for, for the first time. Well, it uh, took a lot of ingenuity on my part to combine a whistle and a harp to make the sound <laughs> of the whistle harp. Um, <laughs> in, the real, in the real world, there's, I haven't seen a whistle harp before, and it would be you know, physically pretty hard to play. So I simply took, I've, I've got a collection of like a hundred different whistles and Native American flutes and ethnic flutes, tried out a bunch of them, came up uh, with just an Irish whistle, but um, so that's the, the, the dragon theme that hauntingly appears in the show. And then I did, I do actually have a, uh, this is sort of a, a Middle Eastern harp or a, a early European harp that I had bought for another project. And so, you know, I played around with this. So as you can hear, it's, you know, me not being a, a trained harpist, it takes a lot of takes to get, uh, all the correct things, but <laughs> it's simply it. Well, awesome. and as she's practicing her whistle harp, it's I leave those mistakes in there, and it sounds even more authentic because uh, she's. That's right. So our first she's player is Lily, and she's just a young girl, right? She's nine, and so there's a there's a wonderful kind of fitment here. Uh, we also have a character in season one, Armalin, who's supposed to be pretty good, uh, and and he gets a song that Andrew wrote. Actually, we we won't get to talk to him about that just yet but uh he wrote this fantastic song for armalin to sing uh and play then on whistle harp as well so if he's singing he's not blowing the whistle so it becomes a harp song right uh and we talked about how do we want to play those harps uh i think ben you were in this conversation too uh that we decided not to strum 
that we wanted to do plucking, right? To give it kind of like a guitar mm -hmm. pluck. Um, yeah, talk about that process and kind of figuring out that sound. Yeah, we knew that Andrew wanted it to sound a little bit like a classical guitar, but the issue would be that it's going to get animated on string on screen and it's going to look like a harp. So ultimately it can't, you know, when you slide your finger up a guitar, the pitch goes up and uh, there's fret noise. We couldn't do that on a harp because there's no neck to slide. Your, so it, it had to be some kind of a harp. Um, and so we just kind of made sure that the harp had as much kind of a warm nylon string guitar quality sonically as it could. And I say we really Kurt just did all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, it was definitely a, a group effort as we talked through kind of finding how those all fit together. Um, all right, so I want to pause and say one thing. So, so audience, if you're out there, if you have questions that you want to ask these guys, go ahead and start putting those in the comments, either on YouTube or Facebook or whatever, uh, and we'll try to respond to this at the end. But I want to back up now and tell everybody a bit about how we make uh, uh, music for an animated TV series. So the beginning of this process is myself and our director, John Sanford, episode director, will sit down and map out the emotional needs of given episodes. Uh, and we'll go through each of the episodes and say, I need something here that feels happy. I need something here that feels whimsical. I need something here that's thrilling. I need something here that's you know foreboding. I need something here, and all these kind of things. And we'll map out kind of that emotional map of each episode and what we might need. That will turn into a list of cues, right? Music cues that we say, hey, uh, Kurt, Isaac, Ben, can you guys help us to land this? And so we had a little spreadsheet between us that was, here's all the different cues. Some of those would be character ones. So here's a cue for Janner. Here's something for, you know, the Igby's as a whole. Or, uh, some of them would be locations, so books and crannies theme. Uh, and, and we get, begin to populate that. Uh, that's the work that's been going on uh, intensely for the last number of months uh, that then creates a library that then Adam and ultimately Kurt can take and build out in each episode, take, just pull it off the shelf and put that cue in the right spot and begin to build out uh, the episode and make it um, hit its marks. Right. And we think about music in service of picture. So the picture is accomplishing a certain moment, right? Something's got to happen and we need music to help us to, to kind of get there. I will say and this has actually been a discussion I'm, I, I know you guys are a part of, but we are interested in doing that sparingly, like to, to let there be some air where we, we don't have to underscore every single moment. We let the music get away and just let the, the story carry for uh, portions. So um, we've just gotten through all of that. And I'm curious for you guys, uh, were there certain cues that, that you've worked on so far? Uh, uh, you know, Isaac, you mentioned one, but are there cues that really turned out to be your favorite? And uh, I'd love to hear that. And then the other, what cue was your most frustrating and kind of the hardest to get at that you really had to crack at? Um, and I don't know who wants to go first here. Uh, just raise your hand or jump in. <laughs> I'll jump in real quick, get mine out of the way. Uh, I seem to gravitate towards some of the heavier, ominous cues because they need a, a you know, mandolin doesn't carry fear and foreboding as well as some low strings and some, you know, I've, I've got, again, I've got all these sample libraries, but, you know, I've got something like a drum here that just a single drum can can create this mysterious foreboding sound. So mm -hmm. I tended to gravitate towards some of these cues that needed, okay, we need a little bit of a string bed. We need some mysteriousness going on to layer then, you know, Isaac playing a, a plucked instrument on top maybe, or maybe yeah. it's just string. So, so some of those, uh, you know, the carriage and the fangs and some of those, Ooh, something's going to happen bad. Um, yeah, and, and while um, while you have this instrument next to you that, that contributed to the most significant melody of your career, uh, I did say, Kurt, I don't think we can have tuba in Wing Feather, and, which is... I know. I, uh, well, you know, ironically, I think it was Andrew that said, you what, you want to bring in Kurt? Isn't he the uh, tuba and accordion guy? That's just not what I'm going <laughs> for. And uh, Chris had to remind him, I do play other instruments also, That's right. you know, remember I, I did super book for 11 years, which is all epic. So, but yeah, uh, yeah. if, if we get a pledge of a thousand dollars, I will play the uh, Veggie Tales theme song on this. <laughs> oh <laughs> my say, God. Say that. That's a throw down yeah, just now. You just did it. <laughs> you just did it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> All right, Ben, uh, favorite cue and, and maybe what was the most challenging one to get into? Um, I enjoyed writing for Pete because I knew that he had a – he starts in one place and he we find out that there's a lot we don't know about him and he's got a long way to go. And I liked writing a theme for him that had reflected who he is when we first see him but that had the ability to then become something – uh, wildly different. So I sat down, wrote the his first iteration, and then I wrote five different versions of that over an afternoon. And by the end, it was sweeping and kind of epic. Mm-hmm. And so I enjoyed that. Which one is the hardest uh, to get at? Which one did you stub your toe on the most? Oh no! I, this is going to make it sound like I didn't stub my toe. I stubbed my toe a lot. Maybe it was just all of them were uh, you know <laughs> a learning curve for me. There, there is not one that comes to mind. Okay. Yeah, sorry. That's good. Isaac, how about you? Yeah, well, uh, like I said um, previously, I really did enjoy trying to figure out what the how, how to make an acoustic instrument work for something scary like, like a Fang. Uh, and I think once, once we got the, the slide guitar thing, then I sort of transferred that over to the Stonekeeper. And... Um, nag and just like that sort of like the the big bad uh and i really really enjoyed doing doing that because there was this sort of like it it needed to uh like precede the fangs and so you know it needed to definitely like be like they they sort of live on the same thread but you also sort of have this like mystical magical whimsical element to them and so it's also it's not quite as visceral as the fangs, quite as physical. It's a little bit, it's it's almost nice, you know. It's like it's almost mm-hmm. beautiful, sort mm-hmm. of like they're they're taking this language that the maker has made and they're misusing it. So it's almost there, um, and I really really mm-hmm. enjoyed doing that. Uh, I, one of, uh, well, yeah, I mean, some of the more difficult ones. Like like Ben said, there really was I had I had a big learning curve, and I think at the beginning, whenever I was just kind of throwing out you know any any idea that I had, uh, mm-hmm. I I was really trying to shove a lot of notes into one theme and make it a little bit too busy, a little bit too complicated, and so I think really the most difficult thing for me was just learning to uh, be be restrained and. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm sort of like unlearn the way that I write music for, for the band. Um, yep. but instead write, write, write for the picture. That was, I think that was just overall the biggest challenge for me. Um, yeah. Yeah. In season one, we have, um, Janner, our lead character, who's, um, got a real special friend, uh, Sarah Cobbler, uh, that's a little romantic, right? Uh, it's mm-hmm. he's 12 so we wanted to pull but didn't want to make a swooning love song but something that's like she's special there's a feeling there makes my heart a little flutter but I, I'm not going to call it anything other than that we talked about getting that right because you guys I, I think between you and Ben there were some really romantic things that popped up and I was like yeah it needs to feel more awkward it needs to feel more adolescent more like I don't quite know what to do with this uh, where did you guys go and I don't know if you actually ended up working together on that one or Isaac you just took it tell me about that yeah, um, yeah. So I think the 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 first cue that I that I did for that and sent, um, it was just a little bit too straight. Like you said, it sort of felt more like something that you might walk down uh, the aisle to on on your wedding or mm-hmm. something. You know, sure. and these are these are these are children, uh, th- and these are new feelings, and they don't really quite know what to do with them. And so whenever you said that, I was like, oh man, you know, okay. My like my my first thought was okay. Got to scrap what I've done and um, like s- start from scratch. How do I make it awkward? But then I think what I ended up doing is Ben let me borrow uh, a a really really crappy acoustic guitar, <laughs> and uh, it's one of the hardest guitars I've ever played. It's terrible. <laughs> I can't wait to give it back to you, Ben. Uh, <laughs> and but it worked perfectly for for something like this where I originally played mm. it on on like my on my my guitar that's really nice but then all i had to do was sub in this other guitar that's a little bit wonky a little bit off and then 
rather than the rhythms being so straight, I kind of gave it a little bit more of a swing, like a little bit more of a bouncy feel, which just automatically put it in a little bit more of a childish place. Um, same, same thing with the mandolin. I've got a really, really bad mandolin, and I would never play it anywhere except here. It works perfectly <laughs> for what we're doing. Uh, trying to make this like whimsical feel, uh, it worked perfectly for that. So, I love that. Uh, ben, any um, kind of favorite moments of collaboration so far? I know for people that don't know the Nashville, you know, and music writing, there's a lot of collaboration, right, uh, between you and lots of artists, and certainly with Isaac. Um, you know, what's that look like in practice? Can you kind of talk us through that? So he has an idea for a thing, mm -hmm. you contribute, or sometimes do you change it? Like, just tell us a little bit about that collaboration process and making these melodies. Yeah, there are a couple different levels of collaboration. And the one that we did the most of was just getting an idea from somebody and saying yes or no to it, like, or getting, you know, six or seven ideas from Isaac and saying, these are the three that I think we should go with. Most of the time we just did that. And then he would flush out the ones that we really liked. Um, but there were, there was at least one, I think we called it an Aaron song. It was like a, a basic melody that could be used for Armelin or for somebody. I can't remember who, who we used it for. And that one, we all sat down together. It was a, it was a melody that had sort of a, maybe it was 16 bars worth of music. And we felt like we needed to get it down to, eight bars or even four bars and so we ended up all together kind of helping decide which parts of the motif were the most important that was really mm -hmm. fun and i feel like it's very um you know i think one of the biggest things that makes somebody a professional is their ability to depersonalize critique um mm -hmm. In, in, in that way, my wife would probably say I could probably get a little more professional as a husband. Um, but like, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I love that in general in, in, in Nashville in a writing room, when someone says they don't like an idea, nobody goes, he's saying I'm a bad person. It's just like, no, right. let's, let's, let's go at it. And people are excited to right. yeah. find yeah. out how an idea can get better. And if they don't, if they, if, if something's important to them, They'll tell you. They'll be like, eh, "I'd rather not touch that." But I think most of the time, you know, it's kind of an eighty twenty thing where it's like eighty percent of feedback. You go, "Yeah, I'm going to embrace that if it came from you," and then twenty percent, you'll go, "Okay, wait a second. So I, I think that moment working on that an Aaron, uh, an Aaron song that was all the whole team working together to make one theme have as much punch as it could have. Yeah, can That's I great. can I add something to that? Yeah. Yeah, that 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 was that writing session was particularly one of the moments for me where I it helped me unlock that that thing that I was talking about where I just I'd been writing way too busy and I needed to to like find a way to simplify like cuz cuz mm -hmm. that was with all of us. So Kurt was there and and also Ben and uh yeah. we had this idea like Ben said that was too long. We sort of like trimmed down the fat. And then also Kurt was able to identify like okay, this is a moment where you can put this little twist on on the melody or like let's let's sub out this this chord for this one and now all of a sudden that little switch made it sound like a movie you know mm -hmm. it, like all of a sudden mm -hmm. this thing that was playing just on a guitar now it sounded cinematic it sounded it, and it and it's really really simple things where i was like okay i need to write this whole new section and you know like it needs to develop and go all these different places and sometimes it, it you know that's that's appropriate but in in that moment that was a that was just key for me to try to like kind of getting over that hump where Kurt was able to identify nope just zoom in on this little moment, tweak it and and there you go. That was helpful for me. That's awesome. Um, all right, so any questions out there from our audience? I have a couple more things I want to hit, but before we get that, uh, uh, any questions that we can answer? Um, I saw that there must be a market for used instruments. Yeah, the uh, there's a way to take. Uh, something that sounds really distinct to make it work. Did you have a favorite character to make a theme for? Uh, yeah, you guys, anybody that... Mm, I, I enjoyed writing for Tink. That was one of the very yeah. last ones that I wrote, and I think I, I'd been putting it off. Uh, and I'm not really quite sure why. I think I was just a little bit intimidated by it. 
Um, yeah. And, uh, oh, there was a thousand pledged. I think that means, uh, uh Kurt, Kurt, you have to do the video show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, start warming up. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed writing for Tink. He's mm -hmm. trying to capture this, like the kid like, uh, vibe, but also like he's, he gets, he kind of gets into to some trouble. He's very, you know, very mischievous. Mischievous? Is that how you say that? Maybe that's how you say that. Mischievous. Mm -hmm. And, and but also choice. he's sort of yeah I feel like, cool he's one of those characters sort of like pete where uh the journey that he takes i mean all the characters do but the journey that that tink takes is is yeah. is pretty wild and so finding a way to uh have a melody that also has the potential to become something more uh was was exciting for me yeah absolutely andrew peterson welcome back boy <laughs> Hey, man. <laughs> Andrew's just going to smile and wave. That's the exactly the right thing. Uh, uh, ben, was there a favorite theme for you? Uh, a favorite character make a theme with? Yeah, I really did like writing for Tink. He, I mean, uh, for Pete. Actually, let me... My piano's over here. Let me get off camera for a second. Really? See if I can remember how to play this and explain why I liked writing for him. Yeah, here's how it went. So it's I'm using That's So I'm awesome. using I'm using half steps uh, at the top of the melody to make it sound kind of like he's bumbling or insane or something like that. Um, and then, oh, let me shift back over. So then by the, by the end of his arc, it's doing this. No, it's not like that. It's. I'm not playing it right. And it's with French horns and orchestration by the end. So I was able to with him use those same like whole steps and half half steps that made him sound like he was uh stumbling around to actually just be the sound of the sort of drama and tension that's you know that's kind of resolving in him or something like that so yeah, yeah and i think great you know, ben, that I love you that can use this, you know, there's you this like, yeah you talked to me when you're submitting that piece like hey i'm gonna play it on piano just so we can kind of get it but imagine French horns. And that's, that's a common yeah, practice, yeah. right? That, that when you're working out, you don't have to necessarily be on the instrument that you expect to play in. Uh, yeah. For you, the piano is right there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, there's this, um, uh, on the subject of the half steps, whole steps thing, there's this C.S. Lewis essay about, um, oh, I wish I could remember the title of it, but it's in The Weight of Glory. And he talks about how odd it is that like, uh, a queasiness in your stomach can mean that you're in love or that you're sick or that you're afraid. Like you use, you know, your body has these mechanisms that actually stand in for a bunch of different things. So I love that, you know, writing for picture, you're kind of aware of like the things that certain musical devices evoke. And sometimes they can be used for multiple things. So you can, the same half step that sounds like queasiness or whatever can also sound like um, some kind of, movement happening in your character, you know, something really deep. It was fun to kind of mm -hmm. push into those realities. Oh yeah. But, um, responding to your question. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Each of us had to kind of write on our own instrument a little bit. I think we did learn pretty early on that it was really helpful if we, um, actually created a working demo of the songs before we send them to you so that you didn't have to guess what we were aiming for emotionally. So that was when we really started to all make our own demos as we went. Yeah, and you're talking about those demos, uh, just to get really practical for those people working in this industry. Uh, what are you working in software-wise to kind of bring these things to life? Well, I can go I'm first. In the, I, I'm in, yeah, yeah, no, you, you. No, no, it's you. <laughs> I'll, I'll go then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, I'll, I'll go. No, Isaac, go. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac, tell me, what do you like to record think, and write in? I think, are we, are we all in Logic, or Ben, are you Pro Tools? I I'm think in we're logic. All, yeah, we're all in we're all in logic. Which made which made things really really easy for trading things back and forth and sending sending demos. So 
Gotcha. So for kids at home, they might be working in GarageBand, uh, which is you know kind of the beginner's guide to Logic, right? <laughs> Uh, yes, GarageBand so, comes with most Macs, and these days Logic is two hundred dollars for ten times the amount of programs that you know we had. We paid a thousand dollars ten years ago for Logic and had a, a fraction of what it has now. So it's just it opens up the playing field to anybody that says, "Man, I really want to explore scoring, or filmmaking, or video editing." It's it's crazy what we have at our fingertips now. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, any more questions uh, from our audience? Uh, anything we want to jump into here? Uh, will the soundtracks be released? Uh, yes, so we're excited about that. Um, as we had in the little intro video at the beginning, uh, we really want the soundtrack to stand alone uh, and to be its own kind of experience for you guys at home. Uh, we did that with a short film still out there that that soundtrack still doing its job out in Apple Music and Spotify. Uh, and yeah, we definitely want to do that. That's a great question. Uh, any other questions we can hit? And we're about to wrap this thing up, but uh, Kurt's got to do something here at the end. So, uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. will it be as <laughs> uh, for the emotional part? Of it, uh, all will organic, there be and I think it's a really good question. Yeah, I'm reading it. Will there be orchestral pieces for the emotional parts, or will it all be organic? You know what? There's a blend. Uh, our goal is that you can't tell which is uh, orchestral. Well, obviously none of us plays French horn, but you're going to have this, this blending of acoustic instruments enhanced with sampled orchestral instruments. So definitely as things get bigger, more joyous, more expansive, we come in there and I start filling things out with, with sampled instruments or more additional orchestral instruments. So yeah, uh, there's definitely a blend of intimate and expansive. Even from episode one, it, we realized there are already moments that are too big. The, the emotions they're trying to hit are just too big for a small ensemble. So, yep. We, you know, actually one of my moments in the process when I was like, we're going to be all right was I just dropped my kids off from school and I was listening to a cue that Isaac had sent to our text thread. And it, it felt like he had invented something new in terms of a blend of, uh, of bluegrass sensibilities in the composition and in the in the, at the core of the cue, but then he had orchestrated around it beautifully, and uh, I felt like we were getting you know when we when you watch that call at the start of this chat that we're doing right now, um, you you heard some of their early calls and they were talking about how they wanted it to be a really small ensemble, and just with anything that you do creatively, there's always the there's always the uh, the dream and then there's the manifestation and they are never exactly the same thing. And so in that moment, when I heard that cue from Isaac, where he had found a way to blend orchestration and organic simplicity in the middle, I felt like, okay, this is the, this is the real manifestation that we were always headed towards something that has Nashville in the middle of it, but is um, able to carry the weight of some really epic moments. Oh, no, we lost Chris. Okay, so I've got the floor. This may be the only time, mark this in history, that we hear a tuba uh, related to wing feather. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is what Larry played at the beginning. And, of course, the melody, which Larry doesn't play. <laughs> and then here I purposely made Larry crack so it sounds like he's not a gifted tuba player thank you man <laughs> seven year old me just freaked out that, I mean oh my goodness wow. <laughs> this is so good amazing oh, love that and, you know, thankfully, uh, Andrew's not here to uh, turn off my feed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said no, Zuba. Yeah, he didn't say it on live stream. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Uh, guys, thank you so much for taking time to spend with us today. It's good to see you all. And uh, look forward to 
we'll get to you soon uh, and tell them more about the episodes that we've gotten into uh, as we get further in this process. So thanks for joining, guys. Good to see you. Yeah, thank good you. Good to see you all. Good to be here. Well, uh, there you go, folks. You asked for a sneak peek at our music process, and there it is. Uh, some great, uh, wonderful artists working on this. There will be more to show there. We've got more players coming in and, and lots more additions coming along the journey. We just started post-production. Uh, I will be going into a, a mix review here later today for episode one. So, like, that's what we're doing. Uh, having internet problems today that's what's parse evidently so uh thanks for joining for this uh live stream and uh next week uh we'll have uh more for you we're going to try to keep doing these week by week and bring you up to speed if you want to engage with us uh go follow us on social media uh instagram facebook all those places and then of course on youtube we're publishing all this stuff out there uh we love chatting with you in the comments too so if you have questions for, for us uh things you want to learn about our product I haven't answered uh, please just tell us. Uh, we love uh, trying to follow your lead. Uh, and we're so thankful that you take the time to get in with our chats. Uh, it's a real joy. And like I said, next week, hopefully, we'll have a trailer for you and uh, a release schedule for season one. Uh, so that's uh, getting firmed up, and we can't wait to share it with you. Uh, thanks again for joining us today, and hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Take care. I really was wanting to put something in the world that the grown-up gets as much out of it as the kids do. More, arguably. I really believe that something special happened with this story. We could not believe how many people jumped on board to help us bring this thing to the screen. It is the most amazing thing to be in a position now where we can bring this to the screen. It's whimsical and it's fun, but it's also got a lot of heart. My goal is to make you cry uh, as much as you laugh. You can't just run off. They've got a pop rocket. Really? When you ran off, I had to leave Lily alone. Lily? Lily? He is a plucky of feathers. Hi, Clark! Get up. The black carriage is here.